of the King is here. The presence of the King is here. of the King. of the King is here. The presence of the King is here. Spirit now. The presence of the King is here. of the King is here. The presence of the King is here. The presence of the King One way. 
morning, everyone. Welcome to all of those of you at home and um, watching with us. We trust that you'll have a really good time with us and a good morning, and that um, yeah, the presence of God will really just uh, touch you this morning, empower you to to live out your life in these these difficult, interesting times. Just a couple of notices that we have for you, and um, firstly, School of Leadership will beginning will be will be starting. Um, on the 25th, that's tomorrow in January. If you are interested in getting a good theological um, base and um, some good teaching, uh, please feel free to chat to David Skivington. He oversees the, the fountain part of School of Leadership. David will be able to help you with the course content and also the costing and all that. So give David a call. His number is on, on the website or you can call the office during the week. The recalled camp, which is for the search guys, the young adult guys, um, it is planned to happen the 19th to the 21st of um, February. Um, that's 18 to 28-year-olds. They're calling us to a camp at Rich River. Obviously, this is very much dependent on the president's announcement on the 15th, but if um, hopefully all goes, goes to plan... Um, the young adults will be going away that weekend, the 19th to 21st. The cost will be 300 rand for the weekend, which includes your meals and your accommodation. Um, so also, feel free to contact David Skevington for more information. Our Connect Day or Connect uh, meeting that we were going to have on the 7th of February obviously has to be moved because we, ca we can't gather. So tentatively, again, we are just moving it to the 28th of February. That's a Sunday from 11 o'clock, 11.30 till, till 1. Um, we'll obviously give more information. Again, it's dependent on the president's um, announcement on the 15th. Karen will be concluding her three-part uh, series tonight on healing. It's been, um, I was just chatting to Dave just now, I was saying it's been um, some real great feedback and it really impact people's lives. So I would encourage you to take a listen. If you haven't listened to any of it, go back and listen to the three parts. Um, it'll really help you on your, on your journey. As far as the East Wing goes, that's our building on, on that side there where the children normally meet. Um, exciting, exciting times. We're beginning on the 1st of February, the start of the month. And so far to date, we've raised just over 370,000. Um, obviously, we're going to need a bit more. Um, we've also got, uh, so far, um, access funds of another 600,000. So we're around a million rand. We need about another million more. So if you can assist us in any way with access funds, um, please feel free to contact me. And um, we obviously will be paying that back and the interest that, that occurs with that as well. So... Feel free to contact me and chat to me about it. Um, but we're very excited. It's going to be starting at the, on the 1st of, 1st of February. We had a nice meeting this week just to finalize everything. So very, very exciting. The farm, um, or the, the Farming God's Way project, is slowly but surely getting underway as well. The slab has been thrown and laid, and the tanks will be coming, and also the fencing for that section will be coming up very soon as well. So look, look forward to it. Look and see what's happening when you drive by. Um, there's lots of things going on, which is ex exciting. Just because we're in lockdown doesn't mean everything stops. Um, there's still a lot of things going on and happening and, and preparation happening for more stuff to come. Because the hope is, then we all know, this too shall pass and this too shall end the season that we're in. And, and God is just really placing us into a position where where we can continue and really just um, uh, empower the community in many ways that will come. And obviously we're coming to the end of the month. We just want to really thank all of those of you that have been so faithful in, in tithing over the last few months. And, and in these times, you know, we've really been blessed by the consistency and faithfulness of your giving. And we've been able to bless so many through our tithe budget and, and obviously through the Mercy Fund, um, which is off offering this morning we'll go to as well. Um, so if you want to contribute um, in the mercy needs, um, please EFT and just mark it mercy. And those of you who have been tithing, please, we invite you to please continue. And those of you that haven't necessarily tithed before or busy checking it out, you know, there's wonderful scriptures we can, we can help you with to show you that it is biblical. And um, yeah, it gives a wonderful just gratitude of thanks to God for, for getting us through this season and this time. 
which will be awesome. And then last but definitely not least, um, Dave has sent out a letter to the congregation, a pastoral letter. And I'd just like to highlight two, two aspects of it. Um, obviously, in this time, we can't be meeting in small groups and, and our house churches. But I would invite you to try to find a way to connect with two, three, four, five, six people, um, if, if it's couples or individuals, where you can just um, find a way that we, we stay connected. You know, um, I think one of the biggest challenges besides the financial and the physical aspect is that whole thing of isolation. So I invite you, please connect with someone, um, take them for coffee, find legal ways that you can connect, and just stay in touch. You know, obviously you have the phone and, and technology, but it's so much better to just be connected in in um, in bodies. So connect with one another, find a couple of people that you can meet with, and um, yeah, just reach out. If you're not sure who, call me. I can, I'll let you know who you can reach out to and connect with. And then um, over the next two months, we want to just encourage people that in the season, use it well, and really try develop a, a, a deeper love for the Word again. So we're putting a I don't know if it's a challenge, but a, an invitation and one way we can inspire us to, to, um, to, to do that is to read the Gospel of John over the next two months. And just um, read it, but I would encourage you, read it through the way that Jesus, or, or look at it through the way that Jesus relates to his disciples and to the bigger crowds and to, to um, Pharisees, etc. Just look at all the ways that he relates and hopefully be inspired and challenged that um, we can relate and connect better in, in the season. So read John and, um, and just discover um, everything about Jesus that's in that wonderful gospel. So be inspired, be challenged, and um, yeah, let us pray, and then I'll invite Sarah to, to lead us in worship. So Lord, we thank you that, Lord, despite the season we're in, despite COVID, Lord, you still are there with us. You are still good. You are still on the throne. And Lord, our hearts are are open just to receiving more and more of what you're doing in us and through us in this season. Lord, I pray that you would continue to inspire us to give of ourselves, Lord, be it financially, be it relationally, be it in whatever capacity, Lord. May we give of ourselves to you and to your your people, Lord. May we look out. May we watch out. Um, may we be your salt and light to, to people that we encounter every single day, Lord, in whatever circumstance. So, Lord, as we come together to, to worship you f- spread out across the city, Lord, I pray that your presence would rest upon this whole city right now. Lord, as all other churches are gathering in their homes and different places, Lord, may your, may your worship may it just be lifted up towards you this morning, Lord. May your presence rest on this place and may people's hearts and lives be changed, even those that aren't listening to anything. Lord, may they sense your presence this morning. May they sense your healing presence, Lord. And those that are struggling with COVID at this time, that are struggling to breathe, Lord, in hospitals and different places, Father, I pray that your healing presence would rest upon them right now. Lord, may people know that you are God and that you are good, even in this season, Lord. So come, Holy Spirit. Lord, pour out your presence upon the city right now. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. to
Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Oh, sufficient sacrifice, so freely given, such a price, bought our redemption, heaven's gates swing.
just look like a child staring at the beauty of our King. Because you are beautiful in all your ways. Oh, you are beautiful in all your ways. Oh, God, you are Yes, Lord, beautiful, amazing, faithful in all your ways. Lord, the thing we love about you the most is your accessibility to us, that you're not hidden from us. You want to be found. It's we who hide from you. And I think of that first question ever asked in the Scriptures by you of men, where are you? It is man who is hidden. So thank you, Lord, that you are not hidden that you want to reveal yourself to us. And we, we stand in awe and wonder as we've just been singing of the realization of who you are and of your love for us. As Nahum the prophet said, God is good, a refuge to all in trouble. He blesses those who trust in him. So, Lord, in these days, in these times, in this very moment, we turn our hearts to you afresh. We ask you, Lord, to show us even more of yourself and bring us out of our hiddenness. Save us from the things that bury us, that tie us up, that diminish us, that tarnish our identity as your sons and daughters. And creation is groaning to see our full liberty the freedom of the sons and daughters of God. Creation groans because this world would be better if we full, were filled more with your wisdom and your ways. So Lord, lead us out of our hiddenness and out of our woundedness into a fresh confidence of who you are and of the unshakableness of your kingdom. So thank you, Lord, that you receive our praise and our worship and hear our prayers today. And we do pray for those that we know and those that we hear of that have been struggling intensely, not only with COVID-19, but with all its implications through the lockdown, financial situations, the isolations that have happened, so many challenges. And Lord, we, we are saying to you at this time, this is a time for us to know our greater need of you. So, Lord, answer our prayers and make yourself known in these times. Renew our awareness of you and renew your power and your life 
in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sora. So appreciate you leading our worship. Well, it is good to gather, at, at least in a cyber or digital way, and thanks to the team here at Fountain Vineyard that are making it possible for us today. And bless all of you, whoever you are, uh, all around this country and globally that might be tapping into our message today and our engagement today. Some hundreds of years before the time of Jesus, in the Talmud, the story is told of uh, Rabbi Joshua ben Levi, who came upon Elijah, the prophet, and while he was standing at the entrance of Rabbi Simeon Johari's cave, and he asked Elijah, when will the Messiah come? Elijah replied, go and ask him yourself, where is he? Sitting at the gates of the city. How shall I know him? He's sitting among the poor covered with wounds. The others unbind all their wounds at the same time and then bind them up again. But he unbinds only one at a time and then binds it up again, saying to himself, Perhaps I shall be needed to help someone else bind up their wounds. And if so, I must always be ready so as not to delay for a moment. He is the Messiah the wounded healer. I'd like to read to you from Jesus himself, who came as that wounded healer, the Messiah, who became poor that we might become rich and uh, took on our pain that we might find healing. And in Luke chapter 4, uh, we pick up a, a statement of Jesus on the Sabbath day. He entered the synagogue, as was his custom, and uh, in Nazareth, in his home village, um, and he was given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Scripture tells us that he turned to the place, which we know to be Isaiah chapter 61, and uh, found the place where this was written and read it. It was a passage concerning uh, the Jubilee, which you can read more about, in, for, in, for instance, in Leviticus 25. And Jesus said this as he read, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your, in your hearing. So Jesus was claiming the prophecies of the Jubilee uh, on himself in fulfillment in his own life. And uh, we know that that actually happened because if we go a little bit elsewhere in Scripture, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, we read of uh, one of the accounts, and there are many of Jesus outworking of that. He went throughout Galilee, this is 23 of Matthew chapter 4, went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Well, the truth is that he didn't just declare it, he actually lived it. But these have been strange days and are continuing to be strange days for us with this COVID-19 and the lockdown and, and all the uh, isolations that have impacted us. And uh, there are many confusions that have come at people in this time and, and uh, anxieties that have come at us. And I want to say right up front as we think about health and healing today and over the next two Sundays after this, anxiety and depression, which have been abounding in this time and, and ravaging many, many people's lives and relationships, circumstances, anxiety and depression are, are injuries, not identities. Can we, just, can we just reiterate that? When we suffer with anxiety and depression, these are injuries, not identities 
identities. There are injuries that flare up when you're not doing something right or when something around you is not right and it triggers the injury of anxiety and depression. Don't own it as your identity. Own it as your condition. Own it as, as an ailment, but don't, don't own it as an identity. God wants us to know that uh, because of the coming of Jesus, we can overcome every ill health and every uh, brokenness that would come at us and we become whole in him. But just before we dig deeper into this, I want to say two things that will perhaps be a, a scene-setting statements for us. The one is that God is good. God really is good. And uh, his goodness is supremely expressed in his compassion. You see, again and again, Jesus looked at the crowds that were suffering um, and uh, broken and lost, and they were like sheep without a shepherd. And again and again, the word is used, he had compassion on them, and the Greek word is plachnobizai, which means like it's the turning of your guts, just such a, a cry for these people. The, the goodness of God is expressed in his compassion. God is not alien to our sufferings. God is not removed from us. He's right there with us. As we, we read in the Talmud story, he's the wounded healer. He comes amongst us, and he comes to take our wounding. By his stripes, we, we are healed. So the goodness of God. And some of you sitting there today and listening to this message have disputed in your heart whether God is good to you. You know he's good because theology says so, scripture says so, other people say so, but is he good to me? Is, is, is he personally good? So the second thing I want to say, while we live in a world where there is suffering, and Jesus did say that in this world we'll suffer persecution. Uh, Paul said the same thing. There will be suffering, and we do live in a broken world because we live uh, in the place where the, the kingdom has come, but not yet in fullness. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Let's never idolize our suffering and make it a focus and something to be esteemed. It's always something that we know originated by man's subjection to the subtleties and temptations and seductions of Satan. And so suffering came and sin came on the back of our misuse of our free will. And we see that in the confusions and the anxieties and animosities that have sprung up in this season. Uh, many, many people are divided one from another um, during this, this time. Uh, and there are conspiracy theories and fake news and so much that's going on that you don't even eventually know what you can take as, as for real. But we know that Jesus is the truth. If we hold on to him no matter what, he will bring us through. I want to just say one thing about the mock... Um, the, the, the mark of the beast that is put on us. Let's not get all uh, spooky about this. This is essentially the mark of humanism, it's understood from Revelation as the number of the beast, 666, which is the number for man trying to be God or live outside of his need of God. And that, that number is on our forehead and on our forehands, on how we think and how we do life. It's the uh, capitulating to the effects of humanism in our world today in its pain, in its confusion, in its drivenness. And certainly we see that in the abortion rates um, that are prof uh, abounding in our day, and uh, some fear will abound even more in the developments happening in America. God save us. God help us. God turn the lights on, on the way that we kill babies, uh, as they did in times past, offering them uh, for pleasure, as it were, to save our own conveniences. So we're talking about health and healing, and we know that health is made up of many things, physical well-being obviously being one of them, a primary one, but much more than that. Our health is made up by uh, how, we, how we sleep, how we eat, uh, exercise, the various habits of our life, the uh, routines of our life, uh, how we relate to other people, our uh, environment in which we live. Um, it's also made up by our use of money or lack thereof. Um, and primarily, I guess we need to say, by our, our sense of purpose and meaning. I love Viktor Frankl's work on man's search for meaning. We need much of these things and many more. There's a hierarchy of needs that uh, we need to be looking into and, and uh, developing if we want to live in healthy ways. But I do know the truth will always set us free. 
and set us free in terms of health and healing as well. So let's hope that God will lead us in this and open our eyes to it. Even, even the, the practice of hurry and the digital world that has speeded up our life so much. Gone are the days when you could write a letter and buy a stamp, lick an envelope, post it, and wait a few weeks to get a response. Now you want a 30-second turnaround time. Uh, things are so, things are, are so, so different. And of course, there, there's lots of debate going around about what's good to eat, what's not, what's good to do, and what's not, etc. There are many debates about this, and I hope that in the, uh, in the lockdown period, when we are resetting many things, we'll be thinking through uh, things that have been unhealthy for us. I certainly have been, and, and I trust that it'll be true for you as well. Thinking through the things that have made our lives uh, less than they should have been, or un- more unhealthy than they should have been or could have been. So if we, if we think about this back in the beginning, as I quoted just now, about the hiddenness in that prayer, the hiddenness of man when God came looking for him. Man was hidden because of fear. Man was hidden in the garden. And there are three times that a garden primarily is mentioned in Scripture, three primary times that relate to our story. That one there in Genesis uh, chapter 3, God walked in the cool of the evening as he would normally walk with man, but found man to be hidden. And then there's the, the garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus agonized to, to be faithful to the will of the Father. And uh, then there's the garden in Revelation chapter 22. And let's just look at that, because this is the garden that we're going to end up with at the end of time in Revelation 22, verse 1 through 5. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Don't you love that? The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in their city, and His servants will serve Him. His servants will serve Him. Let's just, let's just say that again. His servants will serve Him. There's a call to know that it's Him to whom He belong, and the service is the purpose of our lives. They will see His face. His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. What a great garden to end up in, huh? What a great, great garden. If we look back in the creation story, we, we get an idea of how God intended us to live in a healthy way. First of all, creation came about as a result of the community of God, the Trinity of God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And Revelation 1 and 2 both speak of that. Uh, cre- community creates. And that's true for us. And what community of God created was that it com- created the community of man. And man, uh, in our communal relationship, has become part of the mandate that God has given us to manage this world, to manage it with community. And of course, community is one of the things greatest, experiencing the greatest challenge during these isolation lockdown periods. eh? So we need to be pressing into discovering more and more creative ways of being community and not setting it aside as if it doesn't matter anymore. Because if we do that, the world will come unstuck. The world needs our communal care, our compassion one for another. It needs that. And then this community of God created the community of man, which was given the mandate to manage the environment, to create a friendship with the environment, and to, to love this world in a way that we would, we would worship God in our management of it. And uh, so nature does well when we do well with God. And it, it ends up, uh, if we look at the creation account, with, with uh, the community of man actually finding friendship with himself in being naked and not ashamed in the end of Genesis chapter 2. That sense of being at rest, of, of I'm okay and that's okay, and of being accepted. And uh, it's been said by Schleiermacher, a German theologian, that uh, salvation is accepting that you're accepted. It's a place of coming back to, to knowing that you're okay with God. And, and he makes you something that is worthwhile and valuable. But of course, when we, when we, when we fall out of step with the one who, in whose name we, we manage, then things go wrong. And for example, let me give you one example of how uh, our relationship with one another is brought into division and our environment is, is, is compromised. I've got some statistics here. 
that I'd like to share with you on a number of issues. But just on the issue of war and military spending, just look at this. The cost, um, it costs about the same to arm and train one soldier as it does to educate 80 children. Uh, to build one bomber, it costs as much to build one bomber as it did to swipe out to wipe out smallpox over a ten year period. One bomber. It costs as much to launch the latest nuclear missile submarine as it does to build four hundred and fifty thousand modest homes. See, the money required to provide adequate food, water, education, health, and housing for everyone, everyone in the world is about as much as the world spends on arms every two weeks. Doesn't that that wake us up to how we're living so badly globally with our emphasis on power and might and and military strength? It would cost 400 million rand to provide all our schools with textbooks, something we're not even able to do in our current budget, and yet we spend nearly 1.2 billion rand on the research and development of the Roy Falk helicopter. Give you some idea how our values have been skewed because of our, our fears and anxieties and our brokenness, the lack of, of living in a friendship with, uh, with fellow men around us and our environment. And of course, you can go on to add global warming to that with uh, Cyclone Eloise coming onto the East Coast, hopefully transitioning from, from cyclone to, to just a storm, tropical storm but at this point, still considered potentially a cyclone. And they say that these, these cyclones, this weather change on our east coast is, is escalating on the basis of global warming. So because of the entry of sin in our, in our, in our lives uh, and the, the, the damage that that has done in giving, making us afraid of God, we live outside of Him in case He's not going to be uh, reliable to us. We uh, also move towards blame shifting and accusation towards our fellow man and, and Cain kills Abel. We have fratricide taking place and we have gender-based violence because uh, might is right as it is perceived in, in this broken way of thinking. Might is right and broken masculinity wants to be assertive over femininity and gender-based violence is the result of that. Uh, and so we have a very hostile experience in our world today. We reach for fig leaves to cover our shame. Uh, we've lost innocence. And this is proliferating in sexual deviances and difficulties. And many of these have become known to be normal under the LGBTQI label. And they're actually evidences of the fall of man. And for us to make them the new normal, uh, to, uh, to almost celebrate them, is actually to put ourselves at risk of denying God what God what God calls sin is, is not to bring accusation to us, but to bring us an opportunity to turn and to come to a place of healing. Jesus came not to help us just manage sin, but to overcome it. Paul says, sin shall no longer be your master, but you can be healed. And I know in many, many nations it's already become um, homo- homophobic, to, homophobic to, uh, to even mention these things in that context. But this is the truth of Scripture. <coughs> so, There was a time when there was a man who was locked up. He was Jesus' cousin. He was locked up. He uh, was uh, imprisoned for the things he said and um, was about to be be beheaded by Herod. You know the man, John the Baptist. And uh, he was a cousin of Jesus. And in Luke chapter chapter 7, verse 18, we uh, we read of a very uh, negative time in in John's life, a time of great doubting uh, and uncertainty. Uh, like we might experience ourselves in our lockdown moments. Um, Tragically, some of this has turned out to be uh, uh, a real challenge on the relationships that we we wanted to be supportive, and yet many, many homes have come under deep pain and brokenness, and some marriages are under strain, and and, and the strain has not been well managed to the point where uh, uh, separations and divorces have taken place, not remedially, not to bring restoration, and praise God that, that there is grace for, for the change that he wants to bring to us. In Luke chapter 7, John told his disciples um, all the things that were going on. And so he calls two of them together in verse 18. And he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who was to come? Now, they've just come from witnessing a, a resurrection. A widow's, a widow's son was resurrected by Jesus. So these stories are dramatic. 
and John is just wondering, are you really the one uh, to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, this is verse 20, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? <laughs> At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go tell John, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. <clears throat> After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John and, and des describe something of, of, of John and how significant his life and ministry was, but specifically as a forerunner of this inbreak of the kingdom. But I, I, I chose to look at this because John speaks of, of you and I at times in our lives, um, pivotal times, when we say, Lord, are you really the one? And what is, this, what is this kingdom that you're bringing in? How significant is it? And you know, I've had discussions over the last little while with some who, who believe that, um, uh, that the, the, the cross brought not only release from our sin, but from our sicknesses as well. And on that basis, as much as our, our forgiveness is guaranteed by the cross, so also is our healing guaranteed by the cross. And we there, therefore be absolutely adamant that every single sickness could be healed and should be healed. And if it's not healed, then we need to be, ask, be asking seriously the question, why? As we think about this, uh, and um, are greatly helped by people like Alexander Fenter and and. Uh, uh, George Alden Ladd, uh, Derek Morphew, and Derek's written a really great book on, on the Kingdom Reformation that I've been re, uh, reading again and digging into. We, we get an understanding uh, of the kingdom of God and the gospel of the kingdom and the cross's place in that. So let me, let me just take you through that in a, in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> if we think of it like this, uh, that we, what we have is, is old humanity, old humanity, and uh, and, and uh, the prophets, and finally a, a, a period of about 400 and some years, 430 years of silence where the prophets were even silenced. And then there were some uh, rebellious movements, some uh, um, movements that rose up to try to bring a, a, a political and military freedom to Israel. And finally Jesus comes. Jesus comes and is born of a Virgin Mary with immaculate conception, he's born, and we know the whole Christmas narrative, we know his life thereafter, faithfully uh, as a son in, in the house of Mary and of Joseph until he, until he died, and picking up the role of a carpenter in Nazareth, and, and so he lives this life, and it, it takes him to a place of, of a public moment, when he's able to go and publicly declare himself, and exercise the, 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 the life of the Messiah, and do what he said he would do in, in Luke chapter 4. And heal the sick, raise the dead. He did all these miraculous things, feeding thousands of people. And they take him because of his claim to be the Messiah. They take him and they crucify him. So we have, we have the old humanity. Then we have the cross, followed quickly, just three days later, by the resurrection. And now these are very, very significant moments. It's the life of Jesus that brings the kingdom. He says in Luke 12 to his followers, Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And that's what he's doing. He's bringing Jesus is, is the kingdom on legs. <clears throat> he's bringing the kingdom. What he does, the kingdom does. What he says, the kingdom says. So Jesus is bringing the kingdom. It's in him. It's in him. And it's supremely in him in the way he, he goes to the cross. But the healings were happening before the cross. And then the cross comes. And then the resurrection. And, and of course, that establishes our faith Paul says, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. But because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have a guarantee of the completion of all that he prophesied. He prophesied resurrection, he was raised, and so everything else that he prophesied will also come about, including the other timed prophecy of the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, which Jesus predicted in Matthew 24. That happened in A.D. 70. So if those two things happen, his resurrection... And the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, surely everything else pertaining to the, the final inbreak of his kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth would come. So what happened, the old humanity was being transformed by this experience and this encounter with this new Adam in him, in Christ. And Paul picks that language up again and again, in him. 
um, we, we find a, a birth of a new humanity. And I know many of us are exploring what that means to live the life of the new humanity. Um, and we are those who are tasting of the age to come, powers of the age to come and bring it into the present. Even, even as we pray, Jesus said, pray like this, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we, we are the people who are supremely in Christ, and the cross is, is vital to that. It's much more, but it's, it's vital to that. And that stands what should have been a symbol of the defeat of the message of Jesus, because that's what the evil one planned in the cross, actually has become the symbol of the establishment of the new humanity, the cross. I'd like to take you through something here, because Jesus began it, but we know that now creation is still groaning. Paul says that in Romans 8. This is after the resurrection of Christ. In this new humanity, we still have a groaning world. We still have brokenness around us. So if the kingdom came with Jesus, what's with the groaning? Well, here's the truth. It's, there's an already to the kingdom, but there's also a not yet. So we are, we are constantly praying for and fetching more and more of the powers of the age to come and bring it into the present. Let's look at some scriptures on that. In Ephesians chapter 2, chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, <clears throat> we'll pick up, uh, uh, this is, uh, and these are a number of statements that will help us see the difference in the already and the not yet. He exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. When he raised him from the dead, he seated him, huh? far above all authority, all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. So this is the already. We have been seated. It has happened. Seated with Christ. But go to Corinthians 15, uh, verse 24 and 25. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. So... He must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. By the way, that's a statement that comes from Genesis chapter 3. When God said to Adam and Eve that uh, the seed of the woman would, would crush Satan's head. And this is what the reference is here. Paul picks it up in Romans chapter 16 and says a very similar thing. That the seed of the woman, which is the church, will rise up. And in Christ, we will have authority to bring about that which is not yet. So there's still more to come, and it will be completed. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter, chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. Uh, <clears throat> he has made known to us. He has made known to us. This is already, past tense, the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. And going on to, into verse 10, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth, under Christ. It's made known to us past tense. Now you go over to chapter 2 of Ephesians, verse 7, and, and you'll see that he talks about the coming ages, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So we have a, a constant contrast between the already and the not yet. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 this time, where he speaks of what is happening now, now in Christ Jesus. You who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We have been brought near. We do experience intimacy. The curtain of the temple has been torn from the top to the bottom. We can all go in. We experience that, that intimacy. We, this is the already, the now. But um, if you go to chapter 4, verse 13, it speaks there about the, the growth and the progression of, of until we all reach unity of the faith in the Son of God. Till we all reach it. So there's something we, we're leaning towards. Um, reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. We are human becomings, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So on the one hand, if you, and this is true of Paul's writings, he, he lays it out like this in, in literature, uh, there's an indicative and there's an imperative. Because of the indicative, we can lean into the imperative and own it. Because of justification, we can lean into sanctification. It's like the difference between D-Day and V-Day in the war, Second World War. But you know, I love Hebrews. Hebrews is a theology of encouragement. It's a book full of encouragement. Um, 
And this is what he says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Once for all. He has done it. It's past tense. No more will we need sacrifices to, to uh, do, do away with our sin. This is what Jesus has done. But he also goes in Hebrews in chapter 2, for instance, verse 5, to speak of that which is to come. The world to come about which we are speaking, he says. Um, that's subjected to the world to come, that which is still coming. And going to chapter 10, verse 1, he speaks again about the good things that are coming. The good things that are coming. And uh, verse 37 of that same chapter. For in just a little while, uh, he who is coming will come and will not delay. So we have an already and a not yet dimension to the kingdom and to, to our health and to our healing. Um, and we, we, while we might groan along with creation in this life, fact is, we know where we're going to end. We know where we're going. So my friends, as we think about health and healing and as we use this reset time to examine our lifestyle, our attitudes, our relationships, our ways, and some of them are experiencing radical changes during this time, radical changes in their homes, in their workplaces, and in our nations, radical changes. Um, Let's, let's be mindful of the fact that we have a, a mandate to fulfill. In Mark's gospel, the last words of Jesus recorded for us, it was a, a mandate he gave to his, his followers, his disciples, and he, he gave it by way of, of absolute confident declaration in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. He says to his disciples, uh, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whatever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. Who believe in my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will take their place, lay, place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. So there's a, a call for us to recognize that God has given us uh, and this is a descriptive statement of that which would happen to us if we were to believe in his inbreak of his kingdom. We become a people who offer healing to others. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at models of healing and how we exercise that and how we can adjust our lives to become uh, more healthy than we have been and see ourselves as being part of the answer to a hurting, broken world that is, that is desperate to know the good news that Jesus is the wounded healer and he comes to bring about a, a change for all of us. I want to pray with you now and I want to invite you to just to listen to the Spirit as we pray because that's what he, he says uh, when he gives his Spirit to us is in these last days the Spirit will come out upon us, we'll have dreams and visions as he says and we will become part of his great, great release of hope to a world that is hurting, and we will do what he says here, lay hands on the sick. I want us to listen to the Spirit. We want Spirit-led lives, Spirit-led ministries that would touch the lives of, of broken people and lead them into healing, and, and to pray as we do um, that he would lead each of us in the adventure of being his representatives in this world today and to be available to lay hands on the sick, uh, to speak words of life, and to do as he did, and to see more of the, of the not yet becoming part of our present day experience. Let's watch out for the temptation as has been true for, for many of us. When we, we pray, and I don't know how many of you have done this, you've prayed and someone wasn't healed as you thought they should, and you start to doubt whether God can do it, and the, the church has fallen into all kinds of, of witchcraft and make it happen tactics, which is quite demonic, quite frankly. It might be well intentioned, but it's demonic, uh, all gone to a place of, what, what we call cessationism, of thinking that the gift ceased. Healings is only to launch the, the church, not for the ongoing ministry of the church. But it's not so. This is true for all of us living in these, these which are called the last days. We are living in the last days. We know there's still going to be the last of the last days, but we're in the last days. And in these days, God wants us to live in this new Adam, in the new humanity, who lays his hands on the sick, who is a wounded healer to others. So let's pray for his spirit to lead us. That's why he gives, him, gives his spirit to us. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. We welcome your presence. We welcome your presence in our lives. 
We welcome your activity in the world in which we live. And we are so grateful for what you've done in us. And Lord, we stand in anticipation and excitement for what you want to do through us. In a time when our world is experiencing such confusion and such pain. Lord, we pray that you would lead us by your Spirit, empower us by your Spirit. Every one of us today who says yes in the name of Jesus. Empower us to be part of your kingdom answer to the pain of the world. Creation is groaning. Lord, release us in the freedom of your spirit to serve in your name, to lay hands on the sick, to speak words of life, to manifest activities and expressions of kindness and compassion. We pray that you would cause us to be a church of people, a community of people, that serves your kingdom. Doesn't just hold on for survival, but serves your kingdom. Lord, give us promptings and leadings and show us how, show us who. And would you take us over these next few weeks and these next few months into increased lessons of how to be healing agents in a hurting, broken, groaning world. And I want to pray lastly, Lord, for those who might be listening right now who need a healing touch from you. And you know, Lord, you know the inner conversations that many of us have had when we prayed and healing hasn't happened and how do we understand that? What does it mean? Lord, save us from doubt. Help us to preach your word and not our experience. Help us to hold on to that which you say and to keep pressing in until we lay hold of all of that for which you have laid hold of us. Help us be people who do not settle for little but we want the fullness of your kingdom. And so we keep, we, we contend for healing. We contend for reconciliation. We contend for restoration, for changed lives. We contend for the inbreak of your kingdom <coughs> that what you said to, to John could be said for us as well. God, tell John, healings are happening. Lives are changing. Lord, may it be said of us as well because of the things we experience in you. So we pray for more of that. And if there be blockages in us, Lord, would you, would you show us? Would you set us free? Would you help us to, to be more accurately led by your Spirit and more filled with measures of faith to see the inbreak of your kingdom? And Lord, right now, would you touch those that are struggling with coronavirus in particular and its effects? Right now, in the name of Jesus, release confidence that you are greater than every virus and the confusions that are abounding concerning vaccinations lord we pray that you would sh you would send revelation and, and understanding and that these things and opinions about these things would not divide your people we pray that you would bring a, a new maturity in in churches around the world that people would not be divided over secondary things that our unity would be in christ we pray for that, Lord. We pray that you cause us to be a people who stand firm and strong because of Jesus, who is seated at the right hand, interceding for us. So we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our world at this time. Thank you for the privilege of being alive at these, in these difficult days. Called and mandated by you to be your hands and, and feet and your, your spokesmen and spokeswoman to bring forth your kingdom in its fullness, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, my friends. Trust that God will, will lead you. The next few weeks will be an adventure as you follow every prompting of the Spirit to bring His kingdom of healing and health to the lives of others. God bless.